the song a lot, Proud to be an American. And certainly it's good and right for us to feel pride in our country. But those deal with physical matters. Spiritual matters are far greater concern. And likewise, even as we can be prideful over our nation, we should be proud of those things that are of spiritual nature. Instead, far too many today are ashamed of spiritual matters. <clears throat> they are ashamed of God, His creative power, and thus they give in to the evolutionary thinking of our society, or they try to make a compromise with theistic evolution. <clears throat> they are ashamed of His providential working, <clears throat> especially when we start dealing with those of the Pentecostal nature today who believe that the only way that God can work is through miraculous activity, yet we many times don't understand the providential working of God, that is, God using nature and natural laws to affect His will. Many are ashamed today of Christ. We are not to be ashamed of him. Jesus says so in uh, numerous passages. We are to believe on him instead. This includes who God is or that he is God. Uh, John 1 and verse 1. That he is God manifested in the flesh. 1 Timothy 3 and verse 15. We are to believe his virgin birth, that he was born of a virgin, even though man says that cannot be. We should be proud of his life. That includes the fact that he was humble in nature, lowly in nature, his meekness, his love. And yes, even his severity, which a lot of Christians wish to avoid. They want to speak of the love of God, but they don't speak of the severity of God. In relationship to God, it's, uh, Paul would say in Romans 11, verse 22, to behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God. You need to look at both. And that's true with Christ as well. We need and should never be ashamed of his death, a demonstration of the great love that God has for us, and the fact that it is vicarious in nature, the just for the unjust. <coughs> and the purpose of it, that it is for our sins. Nor should we be ashamed of the example that he set. The example for us to walk in his steps. And that's truly the way in which we should live our lives. We should not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The words of Christ himself. They are those words that are going to judge us in the last day. But it is truly God's word not the word of man. And it is that word that, that is the power of God unto salvation, Romans 1, 16. It has the ability to save, James 1. And yet many are ashamed of that because they avoid the gospel in drawing people to Christ for fun and games and entertainment and recreation and so forth. They are ashamed of God's power, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it is those words of Christ, the gospel, that is going to judge us in the last day. Nor should we be ashamed of the church. <clears throat> we should not be ashamed of the church because, for one thing, it's the beautiful bride of Christ. In 2 Corinthians 11th chapter and verse 2, Paul would say, For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one 
or you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Here he is presenting the church as a chaste virgin to Christ. And yet so many today speak disparagingly of the church. In Revelation 19, chapter, in verses 7 through verse 9, John would write, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called into the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Here is that marriage supper of the Lamb. And here is the church, that which is being married to Christ. And unto her it was granted, he says that she would be arrayed in fine linen, that she would be clean, white, and he mentions that the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. That saints, those who are called by God, by the gospel of Jesus Christ to obey that, and that obey that gospel, they are living righteous lives. They are doing righteousness even as he is righteous. Thus, their activity in that. Well, there's those individuals who are called to that marriage supper of the Lamb. But we see that beautiful bride in all of her glory and all of her splendor. It's the church. And as such, it is a glorious institution. In Ephesians, the first chapter, as Paul is setting forth all of these things that are in Christ. He comes to verse 22 and 23, and he says that, he hath, that God hath put all things under his feet, that's Christ's feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Now notice, here is the church, he refers to it as the body of Christ. The very fact that it is the body of Christ shows clearly the importance that Christ would place upon the church. But then notice that phrase, that the church is the fullness of him. It's the fullness of Christ. How in the world can you disparage the church without disparaging the uh, Christ. If you're going to honor Christ, you're going to have to honor the church. And yet so many times today, we have individuals who will speak disparagingly, who will ignore the church, who basically denigrate the Lord's church when it is the fullness of Christ. And then that phrase, filleth all in all, now realize that there's uh, been discussions as to whether that has reference to Christ or whether it has reference to the church. And in reality, it doesn't matter. If it is Christ, then it also applies to the church because the church is the body of Christ. If it applies to Christ, uh, the church, it also applies to Christ. And so... It fills all in all. What a beautiful picture that Paul is presenting unto us of the church, the fullness of Christ. But then something is seen uh, as to value by the purchase price of it. You see it many times how much a person values an object by the price that he is willing to put on that object. Sometimes they value it so greatly 
that they put a huge price on it and nobody buys it. Why? Because they value it more than what others value it. But when you have people who are willing to pay the purchase price, you start seeing the value of that object, whatever it might be. What is the purchase price of the church? Well, it is the blood of Jesus Christ. In Acts the twentieth chapter and verse twenty eight, as Paul is speaking to the Ephesian elders. He says, To take heed therefore unto yourselves and all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. And by the way, the term God there has specific reference in this context to Jesus the Christ. Was not God the Father who purchased the church with his own blood? It was not the Holy Spirit who purchased the church with his blood. It was the Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, that purchased the church. And so when it says the church of God, he's having specific reference to the church of Christ. Because he's the one who purchased the church with his own blood. But now then, we see the purchase possession or the purchase price of the church. The purchase price was the blood of Jesus Christ himself. The precious blood of Christ that is without spot and without blemish. It's that the church could not be redeemed by corruptible things as gold, silver, and so forth. But the only way in which it could be redeemed is with that precious blood of Christ. There's the preciousness, the value that we start seeing relating to the church itself. In Ephesians 5th chapter, in verses 25 through verse 27, Paul would say to hus <coughs> husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Here's the purchase price again. Christ gave himself for the church. in order to be able to cleanse the church. How? Through that act of baptism, the washing of water, as instructed by the Word. There's your new birth process, by the way, in John 3, verse 3, uh, verse three and 5, 5 in particular, that we are born of water and the Spirit. Water, the washing of water. There's baptism by the Word. There's the, sp the Spirit aspect of it. And so he mentions basically even though not mentioning it by name, there's the new birth process. Well, here's Christ cleansing, sanctifying the church so that it can be a glorious church. It can be a church without spot, without wrinkle. He says, or any such thing. It would be holy without blemish. There's a purity that is seen within the Lord's church that other institutions of the world just do not possess. The beauty of the, of the church. But it's beautiful because the price that one, that God paid for it. We sing a song sometimes. <clears throat> And some have questioned the scripturalness of it, but God searched through the heavens to find a Savior. Well, in a sense, no, that's not true, but we use poetic license at sometimes in regards to these phrases. It's setting forth that nothing in heaven could have paid that purchase price. That nothing in heaven was of great enough value 
to pay the price of the salvation of souls and thus the church. The angels weren't all of the glories of heaven. None of it could pay the purchase price. It took the blood of Jesus Christ himself. And then we also see that when you pay the purchase price, you become the owner of it. You go to the store, you pay the price that someone has for an object, that object is now yours. You own it. Why? Because you paid the price. You paid the amount of money that was necessary in order to make that yours. Well, the owner <coughs> of the church then, because of the purchase price, is Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the Christ. The church belongs to him. How dare anyone thus come along and ascribe it to some man? Whether it be Martin Luther, John Smith, or anyone else. How dare them take that beautiful bride of Christ who paid the purchase price and thus is its owner and then try and to join it with something else, someone else. <coughs> but we should also not be ashamed of its uniqueness. The church is unique. It is literally one of a kind. There is no other. There are a lot of pretenders out here but there's only one church. You know, there's a lot of women in this world. Uh, I don't know how m many billions that there are. But there's only one wife that I have. Among all of the billions of women that are the, in this world. If somebody else comes along and says, well, I'm married to him, they're a pretender. That's not true. I have one wife, and that's all. Christ has one church. All of the others are pretenders, but they're not the one that is married to Christ. Can you imagine Christ who taught against the aspect of polygamy? and taught very strongly, one man for one woman. For this cause shall a man, a man, leave his father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they two shall be one flesh. It's two making one flesh, a husband and a wife. And by the way, that doesn't mean two wives or two husbands. It's a husband, one, a wife, one. That's making two, the twain, but you have one flesh. Now, that's Jesus' teaching. Wouldn't it be ludicrous then for him to have more than one bride? To teach this very basic principle in relationship to the marriage relationship and then he turn around and violate the very principle that he had set forth in Ephesians 5th chapter as Paul goes through the, this, this discussion of a husband and wife he comes to verse 32 and he says this is a great mystery but I speak concerning Christ and the church The, the illustration that he is using of a hu the husband-wife relationship, in reality, he's, the entire discussion is about Christ and the church. He's using the husband-wife as an illustration of Christ and the church. I'm speaking about Christ and the church. Thus, here's Christ and the church husband and the wife now then it's not and Christ 
Paul here would certainly teach contrary to the aspect of a husband with many wives. Christ is not a polygamist. And yet, that's what the denominational world would have Christ be. That somehow Christ is married to over here the Baptist and the Methodist and the Episcopalians and the Roman Catholics and the Jews and all of these other religious groups. And that Christ is married to all of them. No, he's married to his bride, the church. <coughs> In Ephesians 1, and 23, we mention the fact that here's, God has put all things under his feet, Christ's feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to uh, the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. In writing to the Colossian brethren, he says much the same thing in chapter 1 and verse 18, that he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. A physical head obviously has thousands of bodies. No, that would be a hideous monster that uh, would be made up, invented, maybe to scare people in a movie. But we know that's not the case. As I look out, you know, I see a lot of people, but I don't see anyone that has one head and multitude of bodies. It doesn't happen. You have one head and one body. Christ is the head. The body is the church. That's what both of those passages state in Colossians 1.18 and Ephesians 1.22 and 23. The church is the body. The body is the church. Christ, the head, has one church thus. And thus, it's no surprise when we turn over to Ephesians 4 and verse 4 to say that there is one body. And these, the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace that we are to keep. And then he goes through these seven ones by beginning, there's one body. What is the body? Well, he's already told us it's the church. If there's one body and the body is the church, then there is only one church. Again, many pretenders, many wanting to claim that they're married to Christ, when in reality they're not. There's only one that is married to Christ, and that is His church, the church of Christ. And when you look at the church, all of the saved are in the church. How can you disparage the church because that's where all of the saved reside? In Acts the second chapter, as Peter preaches this great gospel sermon, <coughs> convicts the people of their sin, as we see in verse 37, when they cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? They're crying out to be saved because they have been convicted of crucifying the very Son of God. God raised him from the dead, showed him openly. He is now seated at, sit, sitting at the right hand of the throne of God. Now there's Jesus Christ whom they had crucified. Now then, they cry out, men and brethren, what shall we do? They're told what they needed to do to repent and be baptized for the remission of their sins. And Peter and other apostles continued to exhort them to save themselves from this untoward or this crooked generation. And then it says, then, then they that gladly received the word were baptized. And the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Now what had happened? They were convicted of their sin, wanted to know what is necessary. They were told, repent, be baptized for your salvation for the remission of your sins. 
Now then, those who received the word, what did they do? They were baptized. For what purpose? For the remission of their sins, for their salvation. And what happened? They were added unto them. But when we come down to verse 47 <coughs> of Acts 2, it then tells us that they were praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. And that's not really a good translation of the Greek when it says such as should be saved. It more accurately would be translated those that were being saved. Those individuals who were being saved, what was happening to them? They were being added to the church by the Lord. How were they being saved? Well, go back to verse 37. Upon their faith, as we see in verse 37, they're told to repent and be baptized. Those that were baptized were added to them. What were they added to? They were added to the church. So everyone who was being saved was being added to the church. You cannot separate the saved from the church. If you're in the church, you're saved. If, you're in the, if you become a part of the saved, you're in the church. Now that's what he's teaching here. There is no way to separate the one from the other. Is it any wonder thus in talking about that Christ in the church in Ephesians 5th chapter under the illustration of the husband and wife, he says in verse 23, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Christ is the Savior of the body. What is the body? We already noted. Chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. The, church, the body is the church. So when it says that he is the Savior of the body, he's saying he's the Savior of the church. If you're going to be saved, where do you have to be then? It becomes obvious you have to be in the church. What if you're outside of the church? Then you're not going to be part of the saved. Christ will not save you if you're outside of the church. We see the importance of the church by recognizing the fact that all of the saved are in the church. Now, don't misunderstand. It's simply because someone's in the church mean, does not necessarily mean that he's going to be saved. Because some, you can apostatize from the truth. The Lord adds you to the church, yes, but you can leave the church. You can apostatize so that you're no longer in that saved condition. But Christ is going to save those who are members of the church. Those are the only ones that are going to be saved. How can we disparage the church then when it comprises the saved? And it comprises all of the saved. In other words, also, all of these pretenders out here to be married to Christ... Not a one of them are going to be saved. Those people in denominational groups, I don't care what denomination it is. Not a one of them will be saved because they're not in the one group, that one body that Christ is going to save. The church then, that one church, belongs to Christ and is going to be called by his name. When we talk about individual Christians, well, the very fact that we call them Christians indicates the name Christ, like unto Christ. And first, or the first time the word is used, Acts 11, chapter and verse 26, the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. And so here is this name of Christian, the name that these individuals who are part of the church take upon themselves. 
They don't take upon themselves Baptist or Methodist or Catholic or Episcopalians or Mormons or this and that. They take upon themselves the name of Christian. And they don't take a hyphenated name like, well, we're, Bap- we're Christians, but we're Baptist. Baptist Christians or Episcopalian Christians or Mormon Christians or this and that type of Christian. No, they're just Christians. Christians only and the only Christians. That's individuals. But as the church as a whole, though, it's referred to as the church, the church of Christ. And thus Paul would write in that salutation in Romans, the 16th chapter and verse 16, to salute one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. Every once in a while, someone smart aleckly tries to claim, well, see, it doesn't say church of Christ. It says churches of Christ. Anyone knows the fact that you cannot have a plural without having a singular. You have to have a singular in order to have plural. He's simply dealing with various congregations of the Lord's church. Congregations in various locations. Such as the seven churches of Asia. In Revelation chapters 2 and 3. Or 2 and 1 and 2. And 3. Those three chapters. You have the seven churches of Asia. What is it? Seven churches of Christ in various locations. Each one of them is a church of Christ. But when you look at them as whole, churches of Christ. That's what Paul is referring to there in Romans 16 and verse 16. The churches of Christ. Church. Individual churches in various locations. Each one of them is a church of Christ. But when you're looking at several of them at the same time, churches of Christ. It's not going to be called by denominational names. It's not going to be going by denominational doctrines. And simply because it has the name Church of Christ on its door, for example does not make it the church of Christ. There's other people who are named Hatcher, using myself as an illustration. Many times those men, in fact, uh, there are many Michael Hatchers in our nation today. If you do a Google search on Michael Hatcher, you will find a whole bunch of them. And many of them are married. But those wives are not married to me. They might be named Mrs. Hatcher, but they're still not married to me because they're not my wife. Do they have the name? Yes, but they don't, still aren't married to me. Now we understand that. That's a you know, basic principle that we all understand. Why is it that when we come to spiritual matters, we don't have the same understanding? Just simply because something has Church of Christ on it, or the proper name, and I'm using name from the standpoint of any of the names, any of the terms that God has used in relationship to the church, simply because it has a proper term does not mean that it's married to Christ. It has to have the proper doctrine. It has to have the proper practice has to have the proper plan of salvation, worship, and all of these aspects. They're all important. But yes, you can't be called by a denominational name and expect to be married to Christ. It's an impossibility. They are not of God. They are of Satan. They stand in opposition to the Lord's church and In reality, they try to destroy the Lord's church with their denominational doctrines and teachings. If you're not a member of that one church that Jesus died for, that he's married to, that he's going to save in that final day, 
then we would encourage you this morning to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do the same thing that they did in Acts second chapter. Upon the conviction of their sin, told to repent, be baptized for the remission of their sins. Those that were baptized then were added by God to that one church. That's what you need to do this morning if you have not done so. If you become a member of that one church, be fallen away, you've apostatized from the truth, no longer living the type of life that God wants you to live. And why not repent of your sins this morning? Let us pray with you for the forgiveness of them so that you can once again enjoy the salvation that is found in Christ Jesus. If you need to come, we would encourage you to do so as we stand and sing the invitation song.